Join us on a journey through Gretsch Heritage. Today's guest, Mark Shulman. Episode 1, Alone on a Steamship. Greetings to the worldwide Gretsch community. My name is Lucas von Gretsch, and I would like to welcome you to the very first installment of Gretsch Heritage. In this live stream format, it is our intention to explore the world of Gretsch, more specifically, Gretsch drums and Gretsch history. Some of you may know me from my web series on Instagram called A Gretsch Abroad. Perhaps some of you I've met at various drum clinics and events here in Europe or in the US, but most of you perhaps I'm meeting for the very first time today. So nice to meet all of you here on this platform. I am live streaming right now uh, to you from the European Gretsch family headquarters uh, here just outside of Copenhagen, Denmark. I am what you would call a modern day Gretsch family member. See, it's my mother's brother, my uncle Fred Gretsch, who is the current owner of the Gretsch company. And it is my mother's father's father's father who started the Gretsch company all the way back in 1883. And I wonder what Friedrich Gretsch would think about the music business these days in these interesting COVID times. Um, I know it's, uh, it's really been a tough time uh, for drummers. And, and I would argue that drummers in the past 20 years or so have always had a rough ride. Uh, beginning with Napster about 20 years ago, cutting into the revenue streams of working drummers. And then, of course, in the 20 teens with the advent of, of streaming uh, and the survival strategy for drummers becomes you have to play live to make a living. And just as it seems that so many drummers position themselves accordingly, we get sideswiped by COVID-19. I unfortunately cannot offer a cure for COVID. But what do you say we go on a little vacation from COVID for the next hour or so? A vacation to a place where us Gretsch enthusiasts can gather together and share stories about Gretsch drums uh, and Gretsch history. I would be truly honored if you would join me on this vacation today. Whenever I think about my family story, I always hope that one day, like a, a Martin Scorsese or a Francis Ford Coppola would come along and make the definitive film about the Gretsch family. For me, in my own imagination, the Gretsch family history has all the makings of, of a wonderful Hollywood film. Some tragic early deaths, soaring successes, and some beautiful love stories. I imagine that the very first scene of this film would start with a, a young 17-year-old boy in 1873, alone on a steamship called the Vandalia, leaving Hamburg, Germany, and bound for New York. Here, that was a picture of the uh, Vandalia, and it was about 330 feet long and 39 feet wide. Uh, and it was about one-fifth the size of the Titanic, for those of you who've seen the movie. <laughs> and uh, the transatlantic journey at this time took about one week for immigrants. He traveled in on May 13th, 1873 at Castle Garden, America's first immigration center. We are still about 20 years before Ellis Island even opened for business. And for those of you thinking about the Statue of Liberty in this situation, well, it was about 12 years before the Statue of Liberty 
would be uh, completed. So we're talking about old school immigration here. And although he traveled alone on a ship, he had like so many immigrants at the time, a vast family network that was established in the US, including an older half brother, William, who ran a liquor business in Manhattan. Now, Friedrich had several jobs uh, when he first arrived. On some documents, we found that he worked as a wholesale grocer. And perhaps, though, he finally found his stride when he got a job working for Albert Hoodlet and Sons, a company that manufactured drums and banjos. In 1879, he marries my great-great-grandmother, Rosa Gretsch. And in 1880, while living at Rosa's parents, they have their first child, Fred Gretsch Sr. Rosa was a piano player, and Friedrich was working in a music store. So we can imagine that there was a lot of music and excitement and love in the air for the Gretsch family at this time. In 1883, Friedrich leaves Albert Hoodlet and opens his own business, Fred Gretsch Drums, at 134 First Street in Brooklyn, New York. Interestingly enough, in this very same year, on May 24th, the Brooklyn Bridge opens, the longest suspension bridge in the world. Speeches and 14 tons of fireworks exploding to celebrate the grand opening celebration. Everybody had the day off, even President Chester A. Arthur was there and gave a big speech. Rosa and Fred, I'm sure, walked across the bridge with their young sons and dreamed big dreams about their future in America. At a time when the tallest buildings were six stories high in Brooklyn, the view from the bridge must have seemed like the view from a mountaintop. They certainly would be shocked if they knew the heights that their small Gretsch business would achieve in the 20th century and perhaps even more shocked to know that 137 years into the future, their great-great-great great, grandson would be talking about them walking on the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883 for the first time. The company at this time is primarily a wholesaler of drums, banjos, and tambourines. And as this company grows, so does the family which by 1895 has seven kids. I bought some pictures here from my house for a little Gretsch family show and tell. They've got seven kids by 1895, and here they are, here's a better picture. Here they are from left to right, we've got Walter, who went on to Gretsch and Brenner fame in the 1920s, for some of you who probably know about that. Elsa, Helen, Hertha, Louis, Herbert, and all the way on the right, Fred Gretsch Sr., and of course the woman standing, sitting next to Fred is Rosa Gretsch. Happy times for a happy family. Unfortunately, this would not last. In 1895, Friedrich sets out on a business trip to Germany, back to Hamburg. Oddly enough, the day before he leaves, he writes a will where he leaves everything to his wife, Rosa. Unfortunately, on this trip to Germany, he gets cholera on the ship on the way back, and he dies shortly after he arrives in Hamburg, one month shy of his 39th birthday. Our family thinks a lot about Rosa during this time, and about how she had seven children, and her husband, who is running a flourishing business, with 12 employees, suddenly dies. And mind you, this is the Victorian age, and at this time, women, for the most part, had no place in the business world. Most women at this time would have been encouraged to sell the business, but Rosa would have none of that. In fact, it was her expansionary vision for the Gretsch company that would soon enough make Gretsch one of the largest musical instrument companies in the entire country. To hear about the adventures of Rosa and her young, up-and-coming son, Fred Gretsch Sr., please tune in to the next installment of Gretsch Heritage, which will cover the Gretsch history from 1895 
1916. Now it's time to introduce our featured artist, a man who needs little introduction for most of you. Uh, you know him today, of course, as the drummer for Pink. But this Gretsch artist has a very impressive resume, having played drums for the likes of Foreigner, Cher, Sheryl Crow, Stevie Nicks, Billy Idol, Tina Turner, just to name a few. My goodness, what a resume. Mark is a very close friend of the Gretsch family, and as you will see here, he is very knowledgeable of the Gretsch history, which makes him the perfect guest for this first installment of Gretsch Heritage. Check him out here in my web series, episode number 75 of A Gretsch Abroad. It's time for a Gretsch quiz. What year was the Gretsch Company founded? That's easy, 1883. Fred Gretsch is currently the president of the Gretsch Company. What is his middle initial? He's a dear friend of mine, it's W. In 1967, the Gretsch Company was sold out of the family. What company was the was the Gretsch company sold oh, to? Everybody knows that it was Baldwin. Wow. The Baldwin years. So impressive. How do you know all this? You read I the don't books. Oh, I've read the books, yeah. Who was the artist relations manager for Gretsch drums in Brooklyn in the 1950s and oh, 60s? I actually know that because I had a talk with Fred about that. That was Phil Grant. Last question. Gretsch brand manager Andrew Shreve. Phenomenal drummer. Yeah, he's great. Amazing feel. What is the name of the band he plays in regularly? Oh, um,. I haven't gotten a chance to see this bo boxcar. Boxcar Seven, is it? Unbelievable! <laughs> you got it right, man. You got them all right. Wow. My grandmother Sylvia Gretsch is giving you a kiss mm -hmm. right now from heaven. Love you, Sylvia. And there he was. That was uh, Mark Schulman. And so, without further ado, please welcome to the show, Mr. Mark Schulman. What's up, Lucas, my brother? There you, you are, You made me buddy. look so good in that last interview. Thank you so much. That was all you, my friend. And man, you are, I mean, the history you're providing is, it, it's a story. It's a documentary, actually. There should be, you got to make the Gretsch documentary next time around, man. It's, this is yeah. exciting stuff. And it really yeah. is a legacy. Uh, so many companies do not have the legacy that the Gretsch company has. And the fact that it was nearly defunct um, in the 80s, uh, I remember an interesting story because I, I was playing with Simple Minds, right? And uh, I was touring so much that – this is actually in the 90s, I'm sorry. I was touring so much that when I get off the road, I would usually just – have the producer engineer say, you know, hire whatever kit you want to hire because I've got all my kits in storage. I'd get off. And I remember I was doing a, uh, the Simple Minds record and Keith Forsey and, uh, was the producer and Brian Reeves, the engineer. So mm -hmm. they hire in this Gretsch kit. And as it turns out, it was a Gretsch kit that was, uh, that Paul Jameson had that was one of Jeff Percaro's old Gretsch kits. Wow. Jeff was known to play Pearl publicly and only Gretsch in the studio. Mm. And we love this drum set so much that we traveled around the world to different studios and they spent more money. They could have bought three Gretsch kits. They traveled and pulled the drums all around because they love them so much. So <laughs> in the 90s, I got the number. I think it uh, was from Glenn Noyes when he was working back. Uh, he's a DW, works, uh, excuse me, with the Guitar Center now. Mm. But back in the day, he was working at um, the uh, West uh, – uh, I forgot the name of the music store. It was on the West Side. But he gave me the number West for Gretsch. West Musky. What's that? West LA Music? West LA Music. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And I called up Gretsch, and there was no answer. It was like the company. I couldn't even reach the company. And mm -hmm. I'm so grateful to Fred and Dinah because basically they bought the company back and put it back on the map. Mm -hmm. And I joined back up with Gretsch. In 2002, finally, mm. I always wanted to play Gretsch, but it was all it was a challenge because, you know, a, a, a company might be making great product, but for the artist, it needs to be easy to be able to access parts and to be able to access people and have all the access. By the way, behind me, you can see all my Gretsch drums from all of the past <laughs> tours, <laughs> and I can go into greater detail. That's but so I owe such a debt of gratitude to uh, Fred and Dinah. Um, 
for what they have done to, you know, Fred literally buying the company back and putting it back on the map and then hooking up with great distribution, of course. Uh, mm. it's, it's just been such, to me, there are so many amazing relationships associated with this brand. It's not just the greatness of the product, because it is, I always wanted to play Gretsch ever since I was a little kid and saw Charlie Watts on the front of Get Your Yaya's Out on the cover, <laughs> you the know, jumping around on a mule with a yeah. Gretsch bass <laughs> drum on the front. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's yeah. true, literally, when I when I show up and when I do sessions and I would tell them, just get whatever drum sets you wanted to get, it was mm -hmm. always Gretsch. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget a very famous drummer, and this is an industry story, but a very famous drummer whose name I will not mention, who endorsed another very famous drum company was doing a drum clinic and in the drum clinic he talked about well you know i play these drums live but of course in the studio i play gretsch because everybody plays gretsch so after a while that's why in in 2002 i thought i don't want to be an imposter anymore i just want to go with what i love because yeah. i'm not I, I never tell anybody to play gretsch because i love it i say find out for yourself because an mm. instrument is so personal. It's like a relationship or a food. Mm. You mm. can't mm. talk people into what they are attracted to and what resonates with them. Mm. But the moment I sat down on the Gretsch kit, I just knew that was what I wanted to do. And it took me five different endorsements to finally get there. But now I've been with wow. Gretsch for 18 years and I could not be happier. Wow. Because it's authentic. I genuinely just adore the brand. I adore the product, I adore the way the drums feel, mm -hmm. and I adore the people. Everybody mm -hmm. associated with the brand. I mean, seeing Paul Cooper yesterday, Paul <laughs> like hand makes, you know, all of the um, the, uh, the the USA kits mm -hmm. and the Brooklyn kits and the re-release re of the broadcaster kits. I mean, he hand touches every single drum. This man mm -hmm. is like manna from heaven. He's God from heaven. He's such a drum master. What do you call? I know that guitar players have luthiers. Is there another name for for drum builders? I don't think we have our own name, and damn it, we should. Paul Cooper. <laughs> What's that? He's Paul, a Paul Cooper, Cooper, right? Yeah, that's all that matters to us, right? <laughs> Obi Wan Cooper, as uh, we call him. <laughs> Obi Wan Cooper, I love it. <laughs> right, right. Paul's incredible. He's incredible. Such an inspiration, and um, also someone who's really played a big role in bringing back, bringing back broadcaster, broadcaster and the Brooklyn series um, at a time when, you know, Gretsch was only yeah. USA custom um, American made drums. And then uh, of course in 2012, uh, bringing the, the Brooklyn series back and in 2014, bringing the uh, broadcaster series back. So I know, and they all sound radically different. It's so amazing yeah. what the difference between Poplar or Gumwood mm. uh, will make, right? Yeah, right, right, right. And the yeah. plies and the structure. I mean, people, mm. I, I, I think that people are, are unaware how the, the structure of the drum, the amount of plies, the mm. combination of woods used, the way that the bearing edges are cut, mm. um, have such a profound effect on the sound of the drum. Absolutely. And the Great Gretsch sound has always been based on this sort of secret formula <laughs> that Gretsch right. has employed during the years, but then there have been modernized versions. Mm. And even some of the, the Renown kit is one of the greatest sounding kits. It's a medium level kit. Mm. It's made in China, mm. but they're so consistent and they're such beautiful drums. Mm. So, I mean, mm. I, I gotta tell you, I'm telling you another quick story because it's so critical. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, now, Matt Sorum, who is now a Gretsch artist, but back yeah. in the day, he was not a Gretsch artist. He was nope. with another company. Yeah. And I went out to sub for Velvet Revolver for six weeks. Wow. And I got called last minute. And I wanted to play a 26 inch bass drum because it was a huge gig. We were, we were co headlining Ozfest with Black Sabbath. I thought, <laughs> I gotta play, I just want a big drum set. Yeah. So um, I called up. Uh, at the time, uh, it was um, uh, who was the the marketing guy, the artist rep um, at the time. I think it might have been Tim O'Neill back in the day. Yeah. And I said, I, I want a kit with a twenty six inch bass drum. He said, All we have is the Catalina Club series. It's a nine hundred dollar drum set, but we have a twenty six, thirteen, sixteen, eighteen. 
Mm. And it's orange sparkle. And I thought, oh, no, okay, I'll take it. And, of course, I picked a, a hand-hammered brass snare drum to play along with it. Okay. Sent it out on the road. We had no time to rehearse. I played with them for six weeks. And I'll never forget Feely, the drum tech, saying, I love these drums better than Matt's top-of-the-line multi-thousand dollar drum Is set because right? they hold their tuning better. So okay. I was playing a $900 drum set yeah. co-headlining the tour yeah. with a student-level uh, drum set at the time. That could and hang. And it still was so incredible. That could hang. And it had its own sound to it. So Amazing. I have just become such a fan of all of the brands. And, I, and I've done literally probably a thousand drum clinics in my day. So I played on every kind of Gretsch drum set yeah. over the last 18 years of doing drum clinics. Is I play what they have. Yeah. I'm not critical. Yeah. You have a Catalina Club, you have a, a USA, you have a, a Renown, you have a Brooklyn, you have a Broadcaster, you have mm. a Blackhawk. I've done clinics on Blackhawk gigs, Man. and they still sound great. So the entire line is really mm. profoundly high quality, and mm. I just feel like this is family. I feel like I'm home. Mm. You know, like I sit behind these drums, and they feel like home to me. Mm. That's all I can say. That's wonderful. Well, welcome home, even though you've been here for 18 years. <laughs> 18 years, yeah. And um, and um, I think since this uh, this is a heritage show, let's talk a little bit about one historical Gretsch drummer that has influenced you the most and why. Well, of course, of course, you know, Tony Williams was such a profound influence because he was so prodigious. I mean, at 18 years old, playing with Miles Davis and those mm. records mm. Um, kind of blew and were so profound in the way he played like ding, ding, ding. He played like four four beats on the ride cymbal, you know, like ding, 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 and just yeah. his feel and his and how he he really created the original fusion, how he jumped into uh, taking extremely hardcore bebop and transcending that into rock. That was profound. Max mm. Roach was obviously mm. a big influence. Tune the drums very, very high. So yeah. a lot of bounce on the drums. Yeah. Art Blakey, of course. And then mm. my favorite living drummer is still Vinny. And Mark okay. Giuliani is of my top three. Oh, yeah. I mean, the people on the roster are so brilliant. Phil Collins is one of the greatest drummers on the planet. He mm. was such a big influence. I was into him way back in Brand X before Genesis. So you mm. put aside all of his great fame as a pop artist. What a brilliant drummer. And always mm. playing the concert chomps and the sound of the concert chomps and yeah. the sound of the room. Just such a profound influence. And mm. Charlie Watts, of course. Now, Charlie, I have an interesting viewpoint because when I was a kid, I was a real snob. I always loved Ringo, but I always thought, oh, Charlie really can't play. And as I got older and older, I realized, oh, my God, Charlie is brilliant and i think mm. can you imagine dave weckle playing mm. in the rolling stones it's like charlie watts is the greatest drummer on the planet for yes. the rolling stones absolutely and taylor absolutely. hawkins is beautiful one of the greatest hard-hitting drummers steve ferrone is one of my great influences of all time mm. Mm. um i can go on and on i mean matt sorum was a huge influence as a rock drummer uh, yeah. uh, you know, when Guns N' Roses in the heyday of the 90s, when I was getting all my production shops and had my original bands and stuff, I'd listen to Matt. I go, man, that guy just has this feel. It was so great. So, I mean, yeah. we have just some of the greatest, greatest artists on the roster. Mm. Uh, I could go on and on. But yeah. Absolutely. Heritage and so, wise, I think that at least answers some of your questions. <laughs> and when, well, I asked you who your favorite drummer was, and you named all of them. <laughs> well, I, I'm naming past There's and so present many. Yeah. Because, because, Beautiful. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, I mean, Tony Williams, and it's funny because I, I named Vinny as my favorite living drummer. Mm. And Vinny's biggest influence, from what I understand, was Tony Williams. So you kind of see right. the legacy yeah. and, and, and how, that's, how that's grown. Yeah. And then, Mark Giuliani is just uh, just profoundly diverse as a player. Mm. I mean, he's playing mm. on everything from Bowie's record uh, to uh, uh, got so many other records he's played on. Anyway, it, 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 yeah. when I'm on the spot, sometimes I I lose my mind and I forget. Okay. But, his uh, solo you know, stuff is incredible too. I've been listening to some of his recent solo brilliant. releases. It's super Sweet. innovative, so cutting edge, creative. creative. Yeah, cutting edge. It's just I really. It sort of opens, it sort of expands your 
Horizons uh, listening yeah. to music. I love it. You know, and Cindy know. Blackman is is is, is kind of like oh, yeah. uh, Tony Williams incarnate. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. she's she's incredible. So wow. many great artists. I mean, I do, again, I can go on and on and on. Mm. Um, but I think that gives you a, a a good sort of reference and cross reference of past and present for me. So looking at artists uh, who've passed away, Gretsch artists, have you met any Gretsch legends before? Um, I never met Tony Williams. I never met Max Roach. Okay. Um, and uh, it's too bad Buddy never played Gretsch. I did meet Buddy. I did meet <laughs> Louie. Um, I met some great legends when I was a kid because I've been playing drums for a long time and I'm in my 50s. Nice. But um, I, I wish I had had the opportunity. Um, yeah. I mean, what a great loss. Also, Tony Williams died so young. It was such a great loss. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you know, we talking about Tony Williams. Um, I wanted to, you know, when you when you look at his career, um, when people look at Tony Williams's career, they they often uh, refer to his work with Miles Davis or, or Tony Williams' Lifetime. And when when people look at Elvin's career, they often refer to his work with Coltrane. Is is there an album or a period in your career so far that you are most proud of and would like people in the future to recognize? Well, you know, it's funny because I've spent so much of my time touring. Um, I played on a lot of Foreigner records. Mm. I played on Simple Minds, Good News from the Next World. These were back in the 90s. Mm. And I played on, um, I'm very proud of all of the work that I've done with Pink Live because that's taken Mm. so much of my life the last 14 years because she tours so much. So there have been four DVDs, Um, you know, the I'm Not Dead tour, um, the Funhouse tour, the Truth About Love tour, and uh, the you know the the Carnival tour, and um, uh, beautiful what's trauma. the name of our last tour? What's that? Beautiful trauma. Beautiful trauma tour. Yeah. Um, I think that why I'm particularly proud of of that is I'm proud of the whole band because we've taken a lot of music that has a lot of programming, and we have literally like evolved it to another level, mm-hmm. um, and. I do a lot of sessions now, but most of them are private sessions or jingles or self-finance. So there isn't anything extraordinarily well-known that I've played on session-wise in the last Mm. few years because Mm. I've spent a lot of my time. Also, I've developed this, uh, at this point, successful, a little little stilted from COVID, but but a... I call myself an activational speaker. So I incorporate drums and use music as the metaphor. And I always have a Gretsch drum set up there with me when I do my speeches, even though they're for nice. corporate audiences. So my life has shifted somewhat, but I'm still Pink's yeah. drummer. We yeah. spent two and a half years on the road. So last yeah. year we played six months and I did 50 speaking gigs and about 10 drum clinics as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a busy boy. That's did for you sure. Have, when do you see your family? My they family come comes out on the road often, especially yeah. when we're in Europe, because my, my wife is Swedish and they love to come mm-hmm. on the road. So my agreement with them is try to not, we try to be together, uh, be together at least every three weeks. And I think the longest okay. we've ever gone is five weeks. And now they're sick of me. They're like, go on the road again. We're ready to yeah. do it again. <laughs> Get out of here. You know, you know, we're actually really enjoying the time together. It's very special. So that's one of the, well, the yeah. good aspects. Of my, my daughter's in the next room. I'm not in our, we have a gallery where I shoot all my big videos, but right okay. now I'm in my office in the house. Yeah. And um, my daughter's right next door, door to me doing her uh, online uh, fifth grade class. So that's we're all what, here together. That's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I know. We check on her. Yeah. She's a good kid. She's an honest kid. So. Did, uh, does she? You mentioned your wife was Swedish. Does uh, your daughter speak Swedish? My daughter speaks Swedish fluently as well as English. As a matter of fact, we dug oh, up nice. old videos of her when she was three. She was speaking Swedish better than English. But wow. she was speaking English in full sentences at 20 months we had her in Montessori school. Uh, they say that, they're, that if a child grows up learning two languages, they're delayed in their primary language. Right. She was just advanced in both. I mean, linguistically, mm. she's very advanced. You know, mm. we're working on her math scores right now, but her yeah. English and her writing is great. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. She must. I wonder if she recognizes uh, how interesting her father is, uh, or she maybe could think that all of her friends' dads 
are like you. <laughs> I think and she it, has a reasonable understanding. I mean, she yeah. is an actor. She's been studying acting for for four years, so she does auditions mm. right now. They're online. Yeah. Um, she has a, a, a brown belt in martial arts. Wow. She's only 10 years old, oh. and they've been on the road a lot. She understands that what I do is what I do. She understands my speaking and my drumming, and mm. she does love the lifestyle. My, you know, I'm fortunate that my family both really appreciate the lifestyle, and they, even though they miss me when I'm gone, they understand and appreciate that what I do is. I'm very fortunate. I'm very grateful to be in a in this wonderful situation where I've had a successful career as a musician for 30 years, touring with some of the great artists. And uh, when she was very young, I was touring with Foreigner. She doesn't really remember the Foreigner years because I went back mm. with Pink in mm. 2013 and she was only born in 2010. Mm. But she's been on a lot of tours and they really enjoy the lifestyle and they appreciate it. And um, she also really understands, she doesn't play music. So her interest is in acting and in writing. Mm. And uh, she has her own creative interests, but she's not a musician. She sings well, she dances well. Mm. Um, so she thinks I'm cool, but you know, I'm dad. Mm. She knows that I'm dad. She doesn't give me any, she doesn't put me on a pedestal or think I'm any cooler because I play with pink. We'll put it that way. Okay, so she's down to earth. She's down to <laughs> earth and she understands that, hey, daddy's got a gig and that's daddy's gig. and. Yeah. Um, we enjoy that and we appreciate that. I'll never forget the, you know, the famous line is, you know, when she was just old enough to really kind of appreciate, cause she was two and a half months when we crossed the Atlantic and did the carnival tour with pink during the summer, our first stadium tour. Mm. So she didn't remember any of that. Mm. But one of her earliest memories is we did the, um, uh, what was it? The I heart radio special in, Las Vegas, and she was about two and a half years old or three years old. And I remember she was watching, and the famous line my wife always talks about it. She turns to my wife and says, Mommy, look, Willow's mama can fly. Daddy just plays drums. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been friends with Willow, and she didn't even say pink or Alicia, right. as we call her, of course. Right, right. Like, now that's special. <laughs> she flies. Daddy's just sitting playing drums. You know, yeah. for her, it's like a. She, she, she just, you know, was kind of modest about, about daddy's impact and influence on uh, what's going on. Well, but, uh, I can so, tell you, know, you. But, but I'm very humble about it too. I mean, I, I, it's not about ego for me. I'm, I'm here to be of service. I look at everything I do as being of service mm. to Alicia, to the band, to the mm. audience, to the crew members, to everybody working on the tour. I've mm. always approached my profession as as I'm in the service industry mm. uh, to support others and to make everybody else's life easier. Mm. It's interesting. So and I, I don't I, walk I, around going, hey, I'm the German for pink. Hey, you know, it's like yeah. at home, I'm dad. I get up in the morning. My favorite thing is I get up and I make her breakfast and we have a bearded dragon. I, fear, I, fe I, I feed um, Go-Go the bearded dragon. I bring my wife coffee. I mean, I'm the early riser. I'm the morning guy. It's like, I'm dad, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm such a dad. Yeah. So Cool. That's amazing. And I, I, I'm surprised that she thought you're just the drummer because when I saw you perform live last summer, what I was really impressed with was was the wonderful showmanship that you bring to the stage. And, and we the call charisma. it showmanship, by the way. The showmanship. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, charisma and energy. Thank you. I appreciate really the compliment. Thank you. A, a technicolor display of drumming brilliance. And oh, go on. So funny. Well, you know, I got to tell you, when you have a boss who is that extraordinary, it's like any of these other drummers. Mm. You know, Tony Williams was brilliant because he's playing with Miles. Mm. And when you're playing with artists that are so, ex I'm fortunate enough because Alicia is, so, if you took away all of the, Aerial stuff and just listen to that instrument, that voice of hers. She's absolutely brilliant. Mm. And she inspires us all. I mean, everybody on that tour, 225 people. We played a record breaking stadium tour in Europe last year. Yeah. You know, 30 to 100,000 people. We have 225 people. Every single person on the tour mm. is world class at what they yeah. do, from the third yeah. carpenter to the gal that puts the water on stage to the gal that sets up the dressing rooms. Mm. These people are all the best of the best. Mm. So we all 
do what we do. We're all equally as important and we all fulfill a job that without any one of us, the tour can't go on. Mm. And Pink yeah. is such an amazing boss that she ultimately, along with Roger Davies, the manager, picked the right people. Mm. And that's what makes the tour so extraordinary mm. because it's like a, the, a finely, finely tuned masterpiece mm. that has to be timed. Mm. And every aspect, every nuance needs to have every detail of attention paid at all times. Or mm. people can get killed on this tour. I mean, she's doing yeah. death-defying stunts. Mm. Not necessarily just to impress, but I mean, when she's up and she's doing aerial stunts, I mean, if mm. something goes wrong, mm. she can die. Yeah. So yeah. in some ways, what my daughter said is kind of right. I'm pretty safe on that <laughs> stage. I play drums. When Alicia's up flying around 30 feet above the stage, or during so what flying across the audience going 30 miles an hour and drops of up to 25 feet. Mm. That is seriously life threatening if something mm. goes wrong. And she almost mm. lost her life in 2010. Wow. Look up the Berlin concert, 50,000 people when she wasn't Me clipped too. in on one side with yeah. the Caribbean or clip and she got dragged across the straight stage and yanked off the side of the stage into the pit six feet and pulled up against the metal side railing. I literally thought she was dead. Yeah, Oy. I mean, it was, she, she recovered so quickly from that, right? It was just dude, the next she, she night. Crawl, just... her, her husband helped her crawl back on stage. She couldn't even walk. She was leaning yeah. on him. And the first thing she does in her feeble voice is she apologizes to the audience and says, I'm so sorry, but I think I'm too injured to perform the last song. But yeah. I want to make it up to everybody. I'm willing to give everybody their money back with one song left. Wow. And then they <laughs> hop her off on a stretcher. And then the audience was roaring even louder. And I looked in the eyes of the audience and half the people were in tears. I mean, it moved me yeah. to tears. I think it's the moment we all realized we almost lost Pink. She yeah. could have died right then and there. Yeah. If she wasn't built like a truck, she didn't even break any. <laughs> I mean, like a mere mortal like me would have been in a hospital for a month. She didn't break any bones. She barely broke any skin. Mm. But that's because she's in such great shape. Yeah, she takes. I mean, she she trains six months before we start going in three months of rehearsal for the tour. I mean, she's mm. an extraordinary artist. So, getting mm. back to your original thing, you're complimenting my playing is like, well, thanks a lot. But what's extraordinary is performing with her and with these yeah. amazing musicians, Justin on guitar and Eva and Jason and Adriana and Jesse and Stacy and Jenny. Um, I mean, these people are all the best of the best, not to mention all the dancers. And I have the greatest drum. I have Gary Grimm as my drum tech. Gary's tech for Steve Gadd, Peter Erskine, Steve Jordan, uh, Mickey Hart. Uh, I mean, I'm humbled. And Mark Shulman, mm -hmm. I feel like, oh, my God, you're so great. And Gary's attention to detail is so profound. Yeah. The drums are pristine. My job is so easy. I just get to sit behind the drums and play drums for a living. He mm. sets them up. Mm. I mean, my ATA road cases take take up the size of two rooms. There's so much stuff. Mm. My rack, my Gibraltar rack that Brent Barnett put together is so brilliant unto itself, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a monster, yeah. It's every a monster. bit of detail on those drums. And my broadcaster, you know, on this last kit, I'm playing this broadcaster kit that Paul built mm -hmm. with single tension lugs in the middle and long rods. And mm -hmm. I'm just the luckiest guy on the planet, man. I play the greatest drums with the greatest artist, with the greatest tech. I mean, come on, man. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm I'm so fortunate. I, I, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I, I'm Mr. People know me as Mr. Gratitude anyway, but there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing to hear about that. And 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 now that we are in this sort of uh, pause with live performances, maybe you could talk about what kind of projects and plans you have uh, for the time being. What 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 are you working on now, uh, Mark Schulman? Well, I still do my share of sessions, which is great. You know, I've got a recording okay. studio with my studio partners Eric and Julian that I've had for wow. Since for nearly 19 years, we pull our gear together. So my drums are always set up and mic. We got great mic pre's and great converters. And so I can just play drums. I play drums on people's sessions. Mm. Um, I just did a big promotional uh, drum track 
for a friend of mine, uh, Ken Fryrick, uh, who's doing a big promotion to help the first responders, you know, the people in the medical industry that are ones that are treating the COVID patients. I play drums on that. Hmm. Hmm. So instead of resisting my, you know, first I thought I could never recreate what I call my rock show disguise as a keynote when COVID hmm. came around. And I realized that the way we deal, if I simplify anything, is about how we manage change, right? You either embrace or resist change. And at first I was resisting doing my presentations virtually, but we had just converted our garage and I got the biggest green screen. One day I woke up, I said, what kind of story are you telling yourself, idiot? Mm. And I created a really cool virtual version. I played drums with my big, big, big green screen. I still have the drumming in there. I still yeah. do interactive clapping. I still do all my content. So I'm doing a lot of virtual presentations for corporate clients in my garage. I have $25,000 in airline credit. I had 19 <laughs> speaking gigs cancel or postpone for two months in the, in oh, the wow. month of, in March and April alone, 19 speaking gigs gone wow. like that. Wow. So I adapted, like I do things virtual, I do mm. my sessions, mm. and I do a lot of interviews. Today, I've got four interviews. I'm writing a book with Dr. Jim Samuels on the power of attitude, which is my flagship mm -hmm. speech. Mm -hmm. I, I'm interviewing corporate people, drummers. I also get interviewed for a lot of podcasts and okay. um, online uh, uh, interviews. So I'm doing four interviews today. Two of them I'm giving, two of them I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, I make really good use of my time and writing of the book is fantastic. We're redoing mm -hmm. my website. I'm redoing some of my videos. I'm writing fresh content. I'm putting out newsletters mm -hmm. um, every, at least every couple of weeks. I keep okay. very busy because I believe I also like to be of service. Uh, mm -hmm. My friend, Matt Kolb, who's a drummer, has fourth stage colorectal cancer. I literally mm -hmm. single-handedly created an online benefit concert. All my friends donated videos and I conducted it live from my studio and raised $35,000 for Matt because he's oh, doing wow. chemo and had to work. I said, no way. You know, yeah. again, one of these things, I woke up one morning and said, what can I do for Matt? I could do a benefit concert. Yeah. I'll get videos from my friends and I did and raised 35,000. Fred incredible. and Dinah, hmm. you know, donated a chunk of money to that, God bless him. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm trying to make the best use of my time. So rather than worrying or wallowing in what is missing, you know, also, I'm one of the most grateful men. And uh, one of the great speakers now, Brett Culp, uh, said something really cool. He said, gratitude is like an inoculation against the things you think are missing. So instead of focusing on what isn't happening and what's missing, I wake up in the morning and immediately think of three people and three things for which I'm grateful. Mm. And I smile because I know if I smile, I'm literally shifting my physiology. Mm. These are attitude shifts. I talk about the power of attitude mm. in my speech, and it's based on a formula, attitude, behavior, consequence. We cannot control what happens to us, but we always have the power to change, control, or shift our attitudes about what happens to us. And right now, this moment, mm. you can shift your attitude. That's mm. what drives your behavior. Think about the power in that. Yeah. And your behavior is what determines the consequences of your life. So mm. this formula, A times B equals C, it's as easy as ABC. I practice mm. it in my life every single day and it's mm. changed my life. And that's what we're writing the book on because we mm. want people to understand that you can't control what happens to you, but you do have the control of your attitude and you can't let the, the depression and the challenges overwhelm you mm. or you'll just crawl in a hole and you'll mm. dry up and you'll yeah. die. So yeah. I'm always looking for opportunities. My biggest fear is missed opportunities. Right. Mm. So I'm mm. always looking for ways that I can be of service, ways I can be giving, ways I can improve upon what I do. I've been spending more time practicing, of course, which is wonderful. Mm. I like to practice even more. I interviewed Thomas Lang as you know, I interviewed Thomas and, and Greg Bissonette, and I'm I'm interviewing all these amazing people. Mm. And just, you know, Thomas's practice, his work ethic is so incredible, right? <laughs> Yeah, so it inspired incredible. me. So I got to get my ass in and practice more because I I can do it now. You know, I can increase yeah. my vocabulary because practicing is about increasing your vocabulary on drums. And that's what we want to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you find it hard? You, you talked you talked about attitude control. Isn't that difficult? I mean, these days, 
with the influx of so much conflict or bad news, it's super hard to be consistent in, in coming forward with a positive attitude, isn't it? Or how do you, what would you say to some, because I try the, those things you're talking about, I suppose, in my own way, but it's about doing it every day. You need to do it every day. Sometimes I shift my attitude 20 times a day to focus yeah. on the behavior and actions to achieve the consequences. And also mm. fill your mind with good stuff, for God's sakes. That's what my friend mm. Tim Sanders said. He was his chief solutions officer for Yahoo and, and, yeah. and best-selling author. He has this quote, fill your mind with good stuff. I get up in the morning, I meditate, I work out. While I'm working out, I listen to books on Blinkist or I listen to YouTube inspiring stuff. I listen to Impact Theory. Tom Bilyeu interviews mm. all these incredible performers and top, you know, entrepreneurs. I fill my mind with good stuff. I just read Malcolm Gladwell's book. Listen to the news if you want. That's great. But fill your mind with good stuff because yeah. it's amazing what mm. we allow to influence us impacts and affects our attitudes. Remember, it's not what we see. It's not what we look at. It's what we see and perceive that determines our experiences. Mm. So you need to influence yourself. I put on music all the time. I got mm. music like when we're done. Well, actually, I have an interview in 10 minutes. When we're done, <laughs> when, the, when I get the interview, I'll, I'll put music on. I, I always yeah. am listening to different music, trying to you know, increase my, my musical vocabulary, for God's yeah. sake. What, did, what, what were you listening to today? Or yesterday? Uh, oh, while well, I was making breakfast, I was listening to Panic in the Disco. <laughs> mm, <laughs> Panic nice. in the Disco. Because nice. Brendan Urie just floors me at that voice. Yeah. You know, and, oh, and, and then when I was taking a shower, I was listening to Tower of Power. <laughs> oh, cool. So we have Sonos. So we have six Sonos speakers all along the house. And every room I go into plays something different. So I yeah. just turn on and and it might yeah. be Beatles. Yeah. It might be like, like African jazz. It might be Samba. It might be Tower of Power. It might be Earth, Wind, and Fire. It might be Buddy Rich. It might be, um, I love Jacob Collier. God, talk about the probably the greatest living musician in his yeah. 20s in our time, Jacob mm. Collier. Whoa. Yeah. It just doesn't get any more brilliant than that. Mm. So I just listen to anything and everything I possibly can. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And uh, so going back to the, um, the Gretsch heritage topic, I know Mike Johnston, a Gretsch artist, uh, he once told me that when he looks at all of the drummers that have played Gretsch in the past, it makes him think, boy, I have to practice as yeah, a Gretsch man. artist. Do you feel intimidated or inspired by these Gretsch greats from the past? I like to feel more inspired than intimidated. Um I'll never forget my daughter was about to be born. So I was already really emotional. I'm in my 40s having my first kid. And I went to see Vinny play at the Roxy with mm. Tal Bergman. And it was a benefit concert. And literally I'm watching him play and tears start streaming down my eyes. Wow. He was playing so beautifully. It moved me to yeah. tears. Yeah. And to me. Like an opera. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the vision I want to create. Yeah. So, you know, you, if you get intimidated, it causes you to recoil and retreat. If you get inspired, it causes mm. you to want to practice. Mm. So I'd rather be the guy, rather than wanting to throw down my sticks, I'd rather be the guy that goes, wow, how do you do that? And drummers are a community. You yeah. ask a drummer, they'll show you. Drummers are so amazing. Yeah. I've never met a drummer that wouldn't show me a lick. You know, guitar right, right. players, like, I remember, never forget Justin Derrico telling me, you know, he went to GIT, then taught at GIT. His mm. teacher was doing a solo and turned around during the solo so the students couldn't see him. Mm. Who the hell does that? Yeah. Drummers are like, sure, you know, I, my, my, my big joke is like, you know, I called up one of the great drummers, the name will go unsaid. And said, hey, man, we, can you show me some looks? He said, sure, come over to my house. I'll make you dinner, man. It'll be great. I'm like, really? He said, yeah, and I know you're single. I'll, I got this really beautiful girlfriend. I'll introduce you to my girlfriend's best friend. I'm like, you're incredible, man. He said, and if you don't like my girlfriend's best friend, take my girlfriend, please. That's what drummers do. You know, <laughs> it's a it's joke, a sharing of course. Sharing community. You get yeah. my point. It's like yeah. drummers really are a community, man. Yeah. We give. And we look yeah. for reasons to give. And we mm. don't hog it. Give mm. it away. Give it away. The more you give it away, the more you get it in return. Mm. Don't try to hoard your talent or hoard your licks 
mm. or try to be selfish with what you do or mm. get intimidated by other drummers because you're wasting opportunity. Remember, I told you one of my great fears in the past is the missed opportunity. If you get intimidated, you're missing the opportunity to learn. Mm. You're missing the opportunity to ask questions, to contact mm. that person or contact your teacher and also listen to everything your teacher says. That's mm. a very controversial thing that I tell people, but listen to everything your teacher says. Mm. You can always reject it later, but don't reject it in the beginning because your mm. teacher is like a reflection. They're like a mirror. They can show you what you need to learn and what you can gain. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And now do, do as a drummer at, at your level, do you still take lessons? Or? You said you still study, practicing. I still practice. You kidding me? I'm I'm yeah. all about practicing. That's great. Come on in. Mm. Hi, this is Aid Come here. It's my daughter. I'm doing a. We're yeah, talking about Grinch. This is my beautiful. Hi, Zaid. Daughter. Hi. The so one nice who's to meet just, you. She was just, I'm, you know, she's way cooler than me. You know, daddy's not that cool anymore. You know what I'm saying? So it's, so, um, it's the one positive thing about this COVID is that you really get to spend time with family, and it's such an important plus. Oh, it's so brilliant. I mean, the fact that she could just walk in, and I mean, I love that, you know. Hmm. Even hmm. though she walked in to get paper, she didn't walk in and give me a kiss. She walked in to do something in the office and walk behind yeah. the green screen and go back out, right? Yeah. Here she goes. <laughs> I love great. you. Bye, sweetheart. Thanks for like making a little uh, <laughs> entrance. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> so maybe you could talk about um, what you're promoting now. You talked about a new book. Is this book available? Where can people buy it? No, we're not even done. I'm doing all these interviews, so I don't know when it's going to be done. You know, we've got the okay. editor chosen. I've got a, a great book agent. But man, I can't tell you when it's going to be done. It's just going to be on the power of gratitude. But you can follow me. At Marky Planet, M A R K Y P L A N E T. That's my Instagram and my Twitter. And you mm -hmm. can always check my marketmarkshulman.com, which is going to be a new site. Hopefully, by the end of the week, we're putting up new stuff. Nice. And I'm constantly posting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, subscribe to my newsletter on my site. Um, and I'll keep you posted, man. And also, and I do private. <coughs> lessons but my lessons are more like they're like career coaching they're like a one or two one hour blast i will watch yeah. you play listen to you and give you suggestions about career we can do it ongoing i have a lot of clients yeah. ongoing as well yeah um but i'm pretty expensive you can contact me at mark at mark shulman.com goes right to me you can yeah. get me direct and you might expensive. take me a while to get back to you. <laughs> I get a lot of emails that's my direct email, Mark at Mark Shulman. If you can spell that's Shulman, beautiful. and that's your problem, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, you yeah. spell Shulman right, you can get me directly. Wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, you know, let's maybe just see if other people have a final question before we sign off. I know you've got an interview uh, coming up, so I don't want to hold you up. Um, it's so great to, to connect with you here, Mark, and to just catch up with you and, and see what you're doing. I'm always inspired by your positivity and your hard work and your discipline and your gratitude. And uh, uh, my pleasure, brother. Thank you so much for having me. I am, I am a fan. I'm a client, and I'm the vice president. I wish. No, mm. I, I'm just such a fan, and we are such a family. Mm. And uh, for sure, that's what Gretch is. We're yeah, a family, right. big family. family that makes badass drums. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, Mark, thank you. Uh, Thanks again for, for joining us here on this show. It's uh, it's really a special treat to have you. My we were honor. so happy when we heard Thank you're going to so be on the, on the launch. So Cheers. Take care, brother. Take care. Keep in touch, my friend. All right, man. You Take too. Care. Cheers. Bye-bye, buddy. Bye. So that was Mark Schulman. Wow, what a, uh, what a force. What else can I say? He's just a, a force of nature, a drumming force. Um, so I was thinking now, at this point, to uh, check in with the factory in Ridgeland. What do you guys think about that? Uh, my next guest is a very special guest because she is a wonderful person. And she is a person who has worked at Gretsch Drums Production longer than anybody else in the current staff. A remarkable 29 years. 
I had the pleasure to work with Barbara back in the uh, late 90s. And back then, we were a small group of about five or six drum builders. And if we had a good week back then, uh, we would build about 30 to 40 drums. And we would be super happy at the end of the week that we made so many drums. Not drum sets, drums, 30 to 40. And uh, Barbara has such a positive personality. You can always hear her laughing. And uh, she has such an infectious smile and attitude. And, and, and one thing I remember about Barbara was her wonderful sense of style. Uh, one day she would have a gigantic afro, and the next day she would have some complex uh, braids going on, and then the next day her hair would be blue. Uh, that, that, that was Barbara. Um, and as a woman who has now worked for Gretsch over several different Gretsch drum eras, uh, Barbara has established herself as a highly dependable member of the Gretsch drum team and an integral part of the Gretsch drum heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Miss Barbara Fennell. Hello, everybody. There she is. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Luke, how are you? And I'm good, so good to see you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you good, and the hair is blown down, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> and it's now all you're... cut off. It's blonde. It's all cut off. <laughs> it's blonde and short. Yeah. Yes, it's blonde it's and short. Beautiful. Look at that. And I bet yesterday you had a different hairstyle. Is that correct? No, I had this one for quite a while, Luke. I like this one. It's easy to maintain. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. yeah that yeah. shortcut. I got the shortcut too, right here, Barbara. Very easy to maintain. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. Well, well first of all. Thank you for joining us here on this show. What a, what a joy. And um, You're welcome. I wanted to say congratulations to you on your incredible 29 years with Gretsch. Thank you. And, and uh, can you maybe, for the, the people listening in, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where, where are you from? Where, where do you live? Sure. Well, I'm from a little town called Early Break, South Carolina which is a very small population. Hmm. Um, and I started working at Gretsch at, uh, it was 1992. Wow. And believe it or not, I just got laid off from my first job and I told my husband, I'm just gonna sit back and rest, I'm not gonna work. So I went by here and I goes, well, I'm gonna stop there and see whether they are doing any hire. And unfortunately, when I came here, Mr. Gretsch himself interviewed me and took my application. I went home that afternoon, got a call, said Mr. Gretsch said, can you start work tomorrow? And here I am. I've been here ever since then. That's amazing. So my uncle I, hired you. Yeah, of course. Beautiful yeah. story. Yes. Beautiful yes. story. Yes, yes, yes. And I love what I do. I, I, I love what I do. Well, you know, I work with you and I enjoyed working with you. Um, I've logged, I've had, I've packed, I've done guitars, I've done instruments. Mm. I have done it all. Yeah. And, I'm still here. and I still love it now. I still yeah. love it. That's wonderful. And do, do you feel proud to work for a company that is so old and has such a, a rich heritage? Is that important yes, I for do. you? Yes, it is an honor. It is an honor. It is an honor to be here. Um, it only takes me 30 minutes to get to work. I love it. I'm awesome. The weekends, mm. I love that mm. more, and I, I, I love it. And most of all, I love it more because I love what I do, and I take pride in what I do. Mm. And I tell anybody wherever I go, you have to love what you do to do a good job. Mm. And Wonderful. I love what I do. I love what I do. That's great. Do. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about maybe a time when you saw a Gretsch drum set out in the real world and thought about oh, how you made yes. that drum set? Yes, 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 yes. I went many places, even the churches and everywhere, and I see a retro kid standing in the corner. Yeah. And I goes like, oh, I had part of that. I probably put your lugs on for you and everything. Probably had it and packed it too. So, yeah, it makes me very <laughs> proud. And it, it makes me proud when the visitors come down and they remember me. And you mm. know, Luke, I love the smile. You, are, you, you know that. I love the yeah. smile, and I still love the smile. Yeah. So that's, that's what helps me get through the day, coming wow. in with a positive attitude 
That's what helps me get my work done. Positive That's attitude true. and my smile. That's wonderful. So can you tell us a little bit about your job uh, at the Ridgeland plant? And, and, and um, are you the last person to inspect the drums before it gets boxed and shipped? No, actually, I'm the one who pull all the lugs on everybody's drums. Okay. I put the lugs on, I put the bracket on, I put the spurls on, I put the tone controls on. I put the bass drum tone controls, which I hate, but I love it. <laughs> Why do you hate those? <laughs> the bass drum tone controls? Oh, yeah. yes, 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 yes. But <laughs> it's part of my job. I have to do it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm the one. I don't have to lug anymore. I don't have to hate. I don't have to pack anymore. I'm the one who do all the lugging, mm. everything that goes on the drum before it goes to be had. That's what I do. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and, and can you tell me what... You see all the, the drums and the finishes go uh, out the door. What's your favorite finish? Do you have a favorite finish? Yes, I do. What Burnt is orange. Burnt orange. Burnt orange. Burnt orange. The same as Paul Cooper. The same as Paul Cooper. That's Burnt amazing. Orange. Burnt orange is my favorite color, yes. Burnt orange. What is it yes. about this color that's so special for you? Well, I love it because... The color, and I love the color itself, it's unique, and mm. the grain, the color shows the grain in the drum, mm. and I love that. I mm. love that. Yes. Wow. And my next color Amazing. will be Caribbean blue. Okay, that's your second favorite, Carib yes. Caribbean blue. Okay. Yes. yes. So you, yes. Like, you like the stains, the colorful stains that show the wood grain? Yes, that's what yeah. I like. Yeah, you're not into the nitron scene. No, I'm not into the nitron because I think it 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 covers up the beauty of the the grain in the drum. I'm not too into, that's my I don't like the nitron now, but it covers oh. the grain in the drum. Something yeah. that valuable, I think, it needs to show the grain in it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And I guess you've probably seen a lot of uh, Gretsch artists come through the factory. Uh, do you have a personal favorite uh, of yours? Um, a favorite Gretsch artist? <laughs> um, no, I don't have a favorite. I love art. Now you're trying to get me in trouble, Luke. <laughs> I'm trying to get you in trouble. <laughs> you're, trying <to> get me, <laughs> you're trying to get me in trouble here now. Okay, now. Yeah. No. Well, you can name a couple. Okay, for instance, I uh, love Steve Ferroni. Oh, okay. Everybody <laughs> loves him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love um, I have met a lot of artists that came through. Um, that I love. Um, I love. I love Gary from Folk Drums. I love Gary. I love Maxwell. I met Maxwell. I love everybody. Uh, Cindy Blackmon. I love. I love everybody. Yeah, that's but, great. So, yeah. uh, do you want to show us some of the drums you're working on now? I'm not sure if uh, maybe you could just uh, give yeah, us a little sure. sneak peek. I mean, we don't want to show too much here, of course, but maybe uh, you could show sure. us something. Some of the snare. It looks like you're working on some brass snare drums. Is that right? Yes. Beautiful. Yes. This is what I'm working on right now. Brass, um, brass drums. You see, I got a whole lot of them. You are mm. safe. Um, they're heavy, but I can handle them. Yeah. Yeah. But I can handle them. And this so, is what I'm working on. And we also have some finished ones. Okay. If you like them, so I can take you around the drums that yeah. already have been done. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. We have this kit here. We have this. Brooklyn satin black metallic ready. Satin black metallic. Now, mm -hmm. now those, uh, I've seen those with black lugs as well. Does, does that still exist or is that no longer available? No, no. Okay. No. Thank okay. God because I hate black lugs. <laughs> you hate black lugs. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And the okay. next one we have, we have a Brooklyn satin yeah. ice blue metallic kit. Yeah, that color, man. Yeah. Yeah. Put you put you in the mind of an Easter, right? <laughs> Easter. Yeah? yeah. Are you getting an Easter vibe Easter. from that? Yeah. Nah, no, no, no. Yeah. And have we have another kit here. We have a satin black metallic Brooklyn kit. Oh, okay. That's a Brooklyn, yeah. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brooklyn is of course a six ply uh with maple and poplar. Maple, poplar, okay. poplar, 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 maple. Okay, and then we have Brooklyn white marine pearl kit. Hmm. Beautiful white marine. That's that. That's a micro micro kit, right? 
Right, right. Very and nice. And we have, this one is broadcast Mardi Gras. I'm sorry, what, which, what is that? Bro, a broadcast of Mardi Gras. The Mardi Gras finish. Uh-huh, yep. Wow, very nice. Yep. That's kind of, what's the difference between that and a black sparkle? Is there a difference or is it? Is, yeah, the black sparkle. I have or has just one look. If you look at it, it looks more or less like a party, a Mardi Gras, like a party. Oh, whatever. yeah. Now I can see it. Yeah. yeah you yeah. see? Right. Confetti. The sparkle, it just, yeah, it's exactly right. Confetti yeah. vibe. Oh, uh -huh. man. We got to build one of those for Stanton. He's the New Orleans oh, drummer. Stanton Moore? Yeah. Oh, he's okay. the, he's yeah. our New Orleans guy. So we got to send him one. He probably already has one. <laughs> well, see, he's one of my favorite guys, too. He is. Yeah. And then we come up here, we have some snare drums. Right here, we had this great um, um, satin snare drum. Okay. These, yeah. Brooklyn. Mm hmm. Brooklyn. And Brooklyn this snares. one here. Mm hmm. Mm. It's great satin. And this one here, we have a Brooklyn satin mahogany. Mm. Mm hmm. Satin Fritos. mahogany. Boy, does that look nice. Yeah, I like it. Uh, see, you see the green? See, you see how I told you I like the color with the green? Yeah. You like see, the wood I, vibe. I, yeah, I like that. I like this. And wow. then we have what we have. We have five by fourteen bronze USA snare drum. Very nice. Very nice. Yep. And this one we have USA sky blue pearl snare oh, drum. Wow. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And this That's one here, we this is a broadcaster twilight glass. Now that's pretty. Mm. I like that. See that? No. Yeah. So what, how, that looks like, uh, okay, it looks like it's like a, maybe a black sparkle from the camera, but I guess the light also looks it's a little a, bit like the Mardi Gras, but. Yeah, but this is this yeah. the twilight. This okay. is the twilight. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's the twilight. And these and all have nice. 302 hoops, is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, very nice. Yes. And this bunch here is the USA, the black copper. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. And then wow. over here, we have some more bell brass. That's amazing. Those mm -hmm. are bell brass. Okay. And, yes. and you assembled all those drums this morning? Between this morning and yesterday, yes. Amazing. Well, yes. Wow. And yes. Are, the, and are these all going to one customer or are they going to many different customers? Different customers. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. One of yeah. One of the different customers. Yeah, wow. Barbara, thank you so much for, for showing these, these amazing, amazingly beautiful drums. What a, what a real treat. It's, this welcome. is really fun. I think, I think we should try to do this again really soon where we can uh, watch what you're working on and, and see what you're doing and see which drums you're, you're shipping out. And okay. um, it, it's, uh, this, is, this has been a, a real interesting, eye-opening experience for me as well to see back inside the factory and to see you know when you and i were working together yes we, all yes. those drums you just showed me we made in about a year <laughs> <laughs> you're right you're right you know, you're right you're right you're you know, right the, the, you're the level right. of production at that time was much lower and that was before there was global distribution and so forth and right. now this right. is a completely different era for gretch and, right. And right right has it uh did you find it hard when uh, Gretsch started working with Command and, and Fender, uh, when the, suddenly there was a huge drum, jump in productivity? Was that challenging for you? Because you suddenly, from one moment to the next, had a, a huge amount of work to do. Do you no, remember I'm, that I'm, time? Yeah, I remember, but no, it wasn't a challenge to me. Okay. It, it wasn't a challenge. It's like, it's like I said earlier, it's just a attitude to have and I have work to do so just get it done have a positive attitude and just get it mm -hmm. done because it's got to be done wow amazing yeah. you are an incredible person Barbara we Thank we you. just we we're so grateful to have you here and we need to start planning for your 30th anniversary next year well good uh, please let us know when the actual date is okay uh if you could find out the day you started Okay. Uh, and, and, and 30 years ago, and, and just so we know, I know at least, if you can at least let me know, I have uh, 
a, a nice gift that I'd like to send you. And I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of uh, now your fans uh, would, would probably like to say hello and send you something nice to thank you uh, for your hard okay. work and your commitment to the, the craft, okay. your, your dedication to the craft. So, so again, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the Gretsch family, thank you so much for, for all your hard work. And, and thank you for joining me here today. And we'll talk you. really soon. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. You're Great, welcome. Barbara. Talk soon. Take care. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow, huh? That was pretty interesting to see a behind-the-scenes look uh, at a wonderful person, a wonderful drum builder, and uh, some pretty amazing-looking drums. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And um, so that said, I'd like to move on to uh, the next segment in our show. I see we've been running well over an hour. Time is certainly flying as we do this show. It's, uh, it's so much fun. You know, I just look up at the clock, and I, it's shocking to see how fast it goes. But uh, that's what happens when you have fun, I guess, uh, in Gretsch La La Land here. <laughs> so what I would like to do now is a trivia question. And this trivia question... Um, is going, the answer to this trivia question was in my original talk tonight. Uh, so if you listen carefully, uh, you'll know the answer. And our plan is to randomly pick three people who write to us the correct answer in the comments, and we will, we will uh, send, send you a gift. It will actually be this very t-shirt, Raise the Roof, a Gretsch t-shirt. And uh, so there's three winners. And here, here's the question for the quiz. What is the name of the immigration center in New York where Gretsch founder Friedrich Gretsch arrived as a 17-year-old boy? And I'll repeat the question. What is the name of the immigration center in New York where Gretsch founder Friedrich Gretsch arrived as a 17-year-old boy? So if you were listening, which I know mo all of you were, <laughs> if you were listening, you'll know the answer. Um, on the next episode, uh, in a couple weeks, we will reveal the answer and uh, maybe say who the winners are. Uh, so that's about all we have for you folks today. Um, be sure to shoot me a DM over Instagram at Lucas Von Gretsch so we can connect, engage, and discuss in all things Gretsch. Uh, we are a community, and we are all, uh, you know, a, one big family. And, of course, you want to visit the Gretsch Drums uh, homepage uh, seen here. And for those of you guitarists who happen to be watching the shows, it's www.gretschguitars.com. And for the Gretsch family site, it's www.gretsch.com. So there are three uh, principal sites uh, for Gretsch. And um, I would like to give a special thanks to Scott Donnell, Andrew Shreve, Jules Thomas, and all the folks at DW for being such great partners for the Gretsch family. And thanks, of course, to my Aunt Dinah, my Uncle Fred, and the crew uh, at the Pooler office. Also, the amazing Gretsch Drums production crew in Ridgeland, South Carolina. Also, a special thanks to my wife, Papacha, and my daughters, Sylvia and Ramona. And lastly, special thanks to Opa, Richie, and Maggie, and all my beautiful Gretsch cousins. This one is for Gigi. In the words of my Aunt Dinah and Uncle Fred, be safe, be well, be musical, my friends. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.